the reading from the Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, which uh, basically is a love letter, very personal, intimate love letter uh, from God to you. If you are male, then it will be your female God who is embracing you and writing love letters to you. If you are female, then it's a male God. It's whatever pleases you. Uh, but when we realize that, we don't have to even consider that because we're talking about that which is nothingness, spirit. <clears throat> the entire concept of this is based on the instructions of Jesus Christ to practice the single eye, to go into a higher meditation, and to uh, take no thought and begin to practice the ancient Eastern methods of rising above the thoughts of the mind into nothingness. And we were showing this morning that it says in the Song of Solomons that my love is uh, like the cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Well, in the vineyards of Engedi is a fruit that grows probably the only place in the world, and this fruit looks like an apple, but when you squeeze it, it's a puff of air. There's nothing in it. It's just absolutely air. And the confirmation of the need to purge ourselves of all of these thoughts comes again and again and again. But right now we're in the Song of Solomon. You're on page 574. You're in chapter 2, and you are in verse 7. I charge you, O you daughters of Jerusalem. Well, you have two words there. Okay. You have the daughters, and you have Jerusalem. Okay, now the word Jerusalem is the holy city. The word city means consciousness. So it's talking about actually holy consciousness. You say, well, how do you know it means a holy city? Because that's what it means. If you, if you, if you, if you open a, a dictionary on the use of symbolic language in that time, Jerusalem means the holy city. It means the place of holiness. You say, well, you know, just make that up. Well, I know that in the same way that you know that to shoot the bull doesn't mean to kill an animal. It means to have a conversation. This is mysticism. It's symbolic language. The word daughters is the offspring of de the desires of the spirit. And the lower level, it's the desires of the emotion. In this particular level, it's the desires of the spirit. The mother is either emotions or spirit. So here we have the daughters and the desires of the spirit. So here then, we have the daughters of Jerusalem, that is the desires that spring from the holy consciousness. The desires that spring from that which is the higher mind. Okay? So it says in uh, chapter 2, verse 7, I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and by the hinds of the field. Now there's a very interesting thing. Why would he say that? Why does the book say that? Why are we charging the door? First of all, you can see right here that daughters of Jerusalem is some type of a symbolic uh, a phrase, you know, and basically what I just told you is what it means. It means the desires of the of the higher mind, the desires of the consciousness. But now it says by the rows and by the hinds of the field. Do you know what rows are? Fish eggs. Fish eggs. Rows are fish eggs. Okay, and so then what do we get out of fish eggs? Reference is made then to the fish eggs. The fish is the symbol of God the higher self. The eggs is that which is being born or created from within. That which holds the inner life about to burst forth, but is unseen. The unseen birth, if you would. Okay, so then we have, for instance, Jesus was the sign of the fish. Wherever they, Jesus go, they put the sign of the fish. And the fish is always a symbol of God. So then by the rose, the fish eggs is meant, that which is being born from within, that which is being formed within, which is, uh, you know, uh, Concerned by the fish, which is God. So here we have the desires of the spirit, the holy consciousness, that which is the God consciousness being born from within. By the and then there's another word here that's interesting in verse 7. By the rose and by the hinds of the field. A hind is a female deer. Okay? A female deer deer and the deer leap and jump spiring to higher and of course this is the female so this is the aspiration of what this is the aspiration of spirit female is spirit male is mind so this is the higher aspiration of the spirit 
which is being which is being talked of here. So by the rose, that which is the fish, eggs, God, the unseen birth which is taking place within, and by that which aspires through the spirit to reach to the higher places by the hinds of the field. Okay? That now this is the interesting part. Let's go to the next part. We, we've learned this is consciousness. We've been going through the Song of Songs to talk. We're talking about this little place within you that sits on top of your shoulders, consciousness. We're talked about the desires of the Spirit. We're talked about holy consciousness. We're talked about God and the unseen birth that comes within you. We're talked about that which is the aspirations of the Spirit reaching up to higher places. And now listen to this beautiful thing. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that you stir not up, nor awake my love till he please. What is being said here is that you cannot bring forth the divine realm within. You can only wait and wait and wait until the bridegroom awakes. I don't care if you read the New Age Journal or you get this book or that book and you get stones or smoke or you wave wands or whatever you do. It doesn't make any difference if you meditate or don't meditate. It's not going to happen by what you do because you cannot stir the bridegroom to wake within you. When he wakes, he wakes. And when he wakes, you must be ready. Jesus puts it this way. He comes as a thief in the night. Or he wakes up. But... The point is being made that all you can do is wait until the higher realm stirs. You cannot stir it. People will come to me, and I'm sure they come to you and say, how do I meditate? I don't think I'm getting anywhere. Well, you can't get anywhere. Whatever you're doing is fine. Because all you can do is wait. You sit and wait outside the door of the chamber. And as we saw this morning, when he awakes, he will open the door of the chamber. He will take you by the hand to the green bed. And then you and him... We'll have an intercourse, and there will be an orgasm of spirit, and the seed will be ejaculated deep into the center of your consciousness, and there, in that virgin state, you will give birth to the Christ child. That's what this is all about. This was it's all about. Okay. Jesus said in John 6:65, "No man, which means no mind, can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father." In other words, there's nothing anybody in the universe can do. You can't pray your way into it. You can't sing your way into it. You just wait within yourself until he awakes. And so it says again, "I pray you, do not stir up nor awake my love, till he please." So it's not going to happen when we please. It happens when he, which is the higher mind, please. That's a very important thing to learn. And it's a beautiful thing to learn, too. Okay. Don't try to wake him up. Just be quiet. Don't disturb him. Be quiet. This is your bridegroom. Don't disturb him or her, whichever. Wait until he wakes. Okay. Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. The voice is the divine nature, and that divine nature comes to you from the mountains and the hills, both symbols of that which is above, those symbols of that which is the higher aspect of consciousness. He comes skipping. He comes leaping. I mean, there's an energy. There, there is with, See, the doggone thing that is so hard to get through to people is there is nothing spiritual. There is nothing religious. There is nothing of God in any church, in any religious person. It doesn't make any difference if it's a pope or it's a rabbi. As I said this morning, if you got the most religious people in Billy Graham and Pope John, and you got all of the evangelists and all of the rabbis, and you get them all in one room with a little alley cat, the only one that is pure God in that room is the alley cat. The, if you want to go to the holiest person, you'd say to Billy Graham, Billy, you're going to have to sit down. A pope, you have to sit down. Rabbi, you have to sit down. And you go to the whole little alley cat and you say, God. And the little alley cat would tuck itself in and go brr, brr, brr. Like and remember something. Every thought that every human being has is your own idea. But every thought that that alley cat has is God's idea. Huh? Because they don't have a carnal mind. They don't have a carnal mind. They don't plot and plan 
they move in that which is beautifully prepared for them and authored to them by the Creator. And so the point that I'm making with you here, okay, is that as you wait and you just stand there or sit there and wait, it will open to you. You can open a flower and you can see its beauty, but you'll kill it. But if you wait, it will open and it will unfold and it will offer you its love. And that's an extremely important thing. So there is no way to meditate but what mountain, what hill is he leaping on? What mountain is he leaping on? I mean, is there a special mountain that he leaps on? We heard a couple of weeks ago, or whenever we were talking of the vineyard, and we looked up the word vineyard in the book of Psalms, and he says, and that vineyard which you have prepared with your right hand. So then we knew we are talking about that which grows from the right hemisphere of your consciousness. See, isn't it make you wonder? What can you do? How can you get into the right hemisphere? You can't. You don't have to. If you will sit and discipline yourself, it will come down. The doors will swing open. The perfume will fill with inside. And you will be called up the winding stairs into the temple and the holy chamber where the bridegroom waits. And it's a guarantee. And it doesn't make any difference whether you give money well, you don't give money. It doesn't make any difference what color you are. It doesn't make any difference what religion you are. It makes no difference what church you go to. In fact, the quickest way to get there is to abandon religion. Abandon it completely. Come as a child. Get all of your opinions and all of your traditions and take them to the toilet. And then as you put them in the water, watch the great Kundalini circulate. <laughs> And once that's done, once that circular motion takes all of that, you know what, out, then you can be free. And you can wait. Because they're not going to look at you. What are you waiting for? Tell them. Tell them when you sit on the floor here or you're chanting home and somebody says, what are you doing? I'm waiting for the bridegroom. We're going to have intercourse. Of <laughs> course, they'll get chucked because they're not allowed to talk about that. They never do that. They're like women that go to the bathroom. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to do my hair. <laughs> Nobody ever admits the things that they do. But they do them anyhow, don't they? I said this morning, in, in comparing the, the sensuality of the Song of Songs, that it is very much like the intercourse when you have a sexual experience. And when you were finished, and if you don't want to look at the neighbor next to you, don't. You can look straight at me. But when you have finished your sexual experience, you just go, <sighs> and you start to cool down. <laughs> Some of you run to the bathroom, others just cool down. <laughs> but you know what? After you've had your sexual experience of the spirit in here and meditation, I sit and I watch, and it's <sighs> the same. You just cool down because you really have had a sensual experience with creation. It's beautiful to talk about these things with adult, mature, beautiful people. You can't talk about it with them because they don't admit that any of this stuff goes on. Or if it does, it's created as some kind of dirty thing. Well, the Bible doesn't treat it that way. But I wanted to get back to the mountain. It says, my love comes leaping on the hills of the mountain. And I wanted to find out which mountain, because we, we got the correct vineyard, the vineyard he made with his right hand. Let's go to page 504 and look at Psalm 78. And let's see what mountain he's talking about, that he comes skipping and jumping on like a whatever he is. Okay. Oh, and look at it. Psalm 78, verse 54, and he brought them to the border of his sanctuary, even to this mountain, which his right hand had purchased. So we know what mountain. So it's up above, and it's to the right side. It always is in the scriptures. It's the right hemisphere. It's the holy place at the right side, the mountain. Hmm. Now, in the earlier part here, we said, by the rose which we understand of the fish eggs, fish god, the eggs, the unseen birth, and the hind of the field, right? Now, it's important because the hind of the field is the female part of you. That's the spiritual part. So you need the spiritual part 
to be energized upward. Now, as we go to verse 9 of Song of Songs 2, my beloved is like a roe, fish egg, or a young heart, H-A-R-T. You know what a young heart is? A stag, a male deer. Okay? Stag, male deer. See what we've got here? We had the female hind, we have the male stag. We have the uh, heart, which is the H-A-R-T, which is the male, and we have the hind, which is the female. So now we have the aspirations of the spirit and the mind. Huh? The male and the female, the father and the son, call it whatever you want. Can't have one without the other. So if the hind is going to be leaping up to the mountains, the heart must also be leaping up to the mountains. Because if the female spirit is going to lift itself and, and, and climb up to the mountains, then the male mind must also. One can't go without the other, you know. You can't. It's no good. You can't, you, 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 you can't. You cannot get into the dwelling place of the spirit unless your mind is willing to climb up there with you and shut down all of that chaos that goes on. So the heart of the stag or the male deer must climb as the hind or that which is the female deer must climb. Spirit and, and, and mind must go to that holy place. So we touch these spiritual references of the male and the female, which is good. Now let's go to uh, Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 9. Behold, he stands behind our wall. Ah, and look at this. He looks forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Huh? Ah, he stands behind the wall. Well, that's the same thing. As Jesus in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's on the other side. There is something that's standing between you and the bridegroom. And that's the wall. So what, what can we do? What causes the wall to fall? He stands behind the wall, but he's on the other. In other words, he's here. See? back here is that which is you are seeking for your life this is what's going to energize the right side this is what's going to give you dominion over things that hurt you this is what's going to change your life this is what's going to set you free this is what's going to bring you into the harmony with the new age but he's on this side of the wall and you're on that side what is it that will cause that wall to fall let's see let's go to page 192 in the bible and we'll start talking about this thing called if you would kundalini this thing called the energy that rises up through the seventh chakras. And we'll look in page 192 in the book of Joshua. Go ahead. I haven't any idea. I, it can go any way you want it to go. You know why I say that? I simply, the question was, can, he, can the energy always go up from the, up from the bottom or does it come down from the top? I would say with hindsight, given the fact that we have such scientific evidence in the year 1992, I will refer back to that scientific thing that came out of the New York Times that says the electrical energy goes up through the spinal canal and through the nerve centers of the spinal canal and then impacts at the pineal gland of the brain. Okay? I think we have the hindsight now, luckily, of, of scientists who say it comes up from the bottom. Of course, when Jesus died, the, the temple veil was rent from the top down. Okay, but the, the important part of this, Lorraine, is you ain't have nothing to do with it anyhow. Whether it comes from the top or up from the bottom, it's going to go, you know. But it's a good question. And I, I, according to that thing in the back from the New York Times, it comes from the bottom up. But let's look at Joshua, chapter 6, on page 192, because the wall must fall. So it says, Joshua, chapter 6, and verse 14. And it says, and the second day they compassed the city once, and returned into the camp, so they did six days. Aha. Uh -huh. So there you have the six chakras. Okay? They did six days. That's the six chakras. That's, that's, that's the six chakras that go from the base of the spine up until the, to the skull. Now look at on, on verse 15. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day, compassed the city about the same manner seven times. 
And in verse 16, and it came to pass at the seventh time, they blowed the trumpets and they shouted, and the wall came tumbling down. Okay. So it's interesting. Think of yourself. You're adult people. You're intellectual people. Why the heck is that in the book? Why is it in the Bible that they've got to go around the wall six times and nothing happens, but when they go the seventh time, the whole thing falls down? Why is it in there? There's got to be a reason why that's in there. Now go to page 1005 in, in the book of Revelation, and we'll look and we'll see the reason why it's in there. We just saw that Joshua went around the wall six times, and then the seventh time as he encompassed the wall, the wall came tumbling down, which means the energy has flowed up through the six chakras to the seventh chakra, and that broke down the wall to the right hemisphere of the brain. But in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, page 1005, it says, And I saw in the right hand, which signifies the right hemisphere of the brain, of him that sat on the throne, which is the higher realms of consciousness, a book written within, which means within you, and on the back side, which is now bringing you to the point of the spinal column, sealed with seven seals. That's why they had to go through the six and when they reached the seventh, the wall came tumbling down. And the energy that raises itself up those chakras or up those nerve centers in the spine, as it moves its way upward through the sixth, it will impact on the seventh, which is the pineal gland, and the wall comes tumbling down, open to you the right hemisphere of the brain, or opening to you the bridegroom who stands behind the wall, who stands on the other side, it says in the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, on page 574. Okay? In other words, it is made available to you on the seventh. And that seventh, the word for seventh is Sabbath. Okay. That is the Sabbath when you arrive at that place of the ultimate peace. And do you know what the rules are in Jerusalem? On the seventh, on the Sabbath, you couldn't carry any burden through the gates of the city on the Sabbath. You know what it's saying? When you arrive at that place of the seventh, you can bring none of your lunacy, you can bring none of your fear, you can bring none of your guilt, you can bring none of your ambition, you can bring none of your plans, you can bring none of your religion, you can bring none of your traditions. You come with nothing and walk through the gates of the city on the seventh. When you enter through the pineal gate, enter into the holy city within yourself, there will be none of the crap that has surrounded you all of your life because the rule is you may bring no burden into the city. You cannot bring a thought into the city. Hmm? Now look at this, it's interesting. Page 574, Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9. My beloved is like a row or a young heart. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He looks forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. Now windows, first of all, are spiritual vibrations. Windows in mysticism signify the opening by which the spirit winds enter within you. That's just a symbol. But let's take a look at it. Go to page 778. Look at Matthew 3. Okay? Matthew chapter 3, page 778. And in Matthew chapter 3, if you will look at verse 10, it says... No, I, I, I think I've got, no, I got the wrong one. Wherever I am, uh, okay, the scripture I'm looking for, maybe somebody will find it one day, it says, prove me if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out on you a blessing. I'm not exactly sure where that is. I thought it was 310. It's not. Let me try another one, see if I make it. Page 729, okay. This is Daniel. I hope I got this one right. Daniel chapter 6. And verse 10, okay? Page 729, it says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and gave thanks, etc., etc., etc. So when the window is opened... That is the place of the entrance of spirit. That is the place that we turn our attention to that which comes from the spirit. Okay, so the important thing here, that in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 9, is he looks forth at the windows, and the interesting thing was he shows himself through the lattice. You know what a lattice says? A lattice is a crisscross type of frame, okay? 
The bridegroom peeks through. The lattice is the same as a veil. Okay? And he peeks through the lattice or the crisscross frame. And that's how he reveals himself. In other words, he is hidden behind that veil, but he reveals himself through that which is the mystery of allegory, parable, numerology, symbolism. You don't see him face to face, so to speak. He's peeking behind. In other words, you have to look through the symbolisms in order to see him. But it says he shows himself through that lattice. He reveals himself through the veil. The looking through the lattice is not much different than when a woman has a veil over her face and she looks through the veil. So understanding that, let's take a look at page 944 and go to 2 Corinthians. 944, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter... Three. Second Corinthians chapter three. And here's the Apostle Paul talking about the way you read the Bible. And their minds were blinded, for until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. In other words, he's peeking through the lattice. They can't see him. Don't you understand what that's saying? You're reading one thing. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. You're reading one thing, but there is something precious just on the other side of the word. Just on the other side of the literalism, there is something peeking out, and you must look beyond that which is the front in order to see. See, nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away, verse 16. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit is, there is liberty. See. So there, the lattice, the veil, the symbols, the parables, must was turned to the Spirit in meditation to gain wisdom. Because you, you've just been told, He shows Himself that way. That's the only way you'll see God. It's the only way that you'll see Christ. The things that you heard this morning, the things that were so astounding to people, came from through that veil. In other words, behind the words, you have read these words for hundreds of years, thousands of years, people have read this book. But what have they seen? They just read it. Look what happened this morning. We said, my love is like the camphor that comes from the vineyards of En Gedi. Okay, go on to the next verse. Go on to the next verse and miss it all. Because there is something on the other side of the lattice. There is something on the other side of the veil. And when you get to that which is camphor, my love is like the camphor. And you look up the word camphor, and it says it's a crystal. It comes from crystal. And it sends forth an aroma, a stimulant. And what stimulates you then is like that which is in the vineyards of En Gedi. What the heck is in the vineyards of En Gedi? I am trying to reach nothingness. And they say that in the vineyards of En Gedi is that which looks like an apple. But when you squeeze it, it puffs. There's nothing there. And I said, oh, who's going to believe it? Who's going to believe there is such a thing? Remember, even the other, I never heard of such a thing. We have people that work in, with, with flowers and all. Never heard of such a thing. So I brought it in. I passed it out to everybody. Here, read it. And that's what the love is. When there is nothing within you, you are God. Not you, but you. That deep you, the center you. The beautiful you that exists when all else is gone. So what? So then if you want wisdom, what do you have to do? You say, people say, well, where does he get off saying this stuff? I mean, who, you know, how, how does he know that? Somebody said to me, uh, I think it was John said before, he tells this to his friends. He said, well, how come he knows this and all of the big intellectuals and the theologians don't know this? Well, that's another story. But that's not the point. The point is I'm telling you. And you can look at it and say, hey, I'll research this. This makes sense. I'll go, to the, I'll go to the library and see if this guy's full of, or not. Go. See. I, 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 will, I will find out where this stuff comes from. Because I'm telling you stuff that nobody's ever told you before, and yet I'm we're reading it in the Bible. See? Where's that? Does anybody have that sheet? Here, here's one. Here. 
I read in the Bible. Come on with me for a minute. You're all there, Song of Solomon. Page 573 is a Song of Solomon's. You see that? Look at chapter 1. Huh? Now look at verse 14. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engedi. Now you see what I got in my hand here? That's a dictionary. That's from a dictionary. And it talks about what grows in the vineyards of Engedi. And it says the fruit resembles an apple when ripe, a rich yellow color, but on being pressed, it explodes like a puffball. It is chiefly filled with air. Now the interesting part about that is that air is the third stage of consciousness. What does it say in the Bible? We will rise to meet Jesus in thee. Now, the born again Christians say they're going to go up in the sky. That's not what it said. The third stage of consciousness is there. When you raise yourself above the thoughts of the mind, you enter into the third stage of consciousness, which is air, and that's where you meet Christ, where there are no thoughts of yourself. Okay? So then how should I go about trying to bring you, what do we call the program, the television program? Call it hidden meanings. Dark sayings. Understanding those things which are hidden. Understanding that which is behind the lattice. If it says here, he shows himself from behind the lattice, then there is a way of perceiving him, but you must look past that which is blocking your vision, which is the literal aspects of the book. Go to page 541 in the Bible, and let's take a look for just a moment at the book of Proverbs. And look at Proverbs chapter 1. And it says in Proverbs chapter 1 on page 541, it says, to know wisdom and instructions, to perceive the words of understanding. Verse 3, to give the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and inequity. To give subtly to the simple. Verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase learning. Now look at the next one, verse 6. To understand that proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Dark sayings means hidden meanings. That's what dark sayings are. So who is it? What is the hidden meaning? The hidden meaning is the Christ is standing behind the lattice speaking at. So you've got to look past that which is the literal to see him. Okay? Now let's go back to the Song of Song, to the Song of Solomon on page 574. And this is the call. This is the love letter to you. Do you understand what happened? Listen to me. Listen to me. 4,000, 3,000, 5,000 years ago, a letter was written to you. But the postman, who is the religious teacher, never delivered it. Your mail didn't come. I have found the letter, and I'm giving it to you. And as you open the beautiful love letter, the bridegroom speaks to you. And he says in Song chapter 2, verse 10, My beloved speaks and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Huh? Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. What did Jesus say? Jesus planted this seed coming up and conditioned it with, you will come up when you see the man with the pitcher of water. Huh? At the dawning of the age of Aquarius, rise up, my love, and come away. Go to page five, uh, 859 for a moment, okay? And look at the book of Luke. And look at Luke chapter 22, because I want you to see it. Luke chapter 22. Rise up and come away. Luke chapter 22. And verse 9. And Jesus says in verse 9 of Luke 22, Where will we prepare? Don't you want to know? Was he playing games with people? 
He could have said 13 Main Street, I'll be there. It's right over uh, Vito's Pizza. And, uh, he could have said that. What's this thing? But what did he say? He was talking about something cosmic. He was talking about something beautiful. He was talking about something that makes sense to you. Because you know what? You are the ones who were living in the age of the man carrying the pitcher of water. And so he turned to them and he said, Behold, in verse 10, when you enter into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. I should have the fifth dimension singing now. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. This is the dawning of the man carrying the pitcher of water. And he said to you, in your, follow him into the house. And look at verse 12. And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. You don't have to bring anything. You don't have to bring anything. It's all furnished. In fact, you can't bring anything. So what did Jesus say? He says, he'll show you a large upper room. Rise up, my love, and come away. Go to page 946. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And look at verse... 17. Come away from what? What does Paul say? Come out from among them and be separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Come out from among them. From among who is them? Your thoughts. The only enemy you have, the, it says in Psalm 23, I will prepare a banqueting table for you in the presence of your enemies. The only enemies you have in this universe are your thoughts. There is nobody plotting against you except yourself. And we plot all day against ourselves. You know the little voice that says inside, I'm disgusted, I'm fed up, I'm getting out of here, I'm going to quit. It's all a plot against you. And it's being made by you. And all of those thoughts that tell you how rotten it is, how disgusting you are, and you always want to go away, and there's no place to go. Because when you get there, then you'll say, this is rotten, I got to get out for cocktail with this, I don't like this, no matter where you are. I get letters from people with a, with a network, and they're all over from California. Somebody says, I got to get out of here. And then somebody comes from Fork and River, I got to get out of here. So you just swap houses for six months. Hey! And at the end of six months, you'll say, I've got to get out of here, and you'll come back here. And that's because no matter where we are, because it's not necessarily ourselves, but it's the voice inside that tells you this. I remember, I was telling about Frank, with him. we have a, you know, a fellow here who's a good friend. That, he lived his whole life in trouble, chaos. Everybody, cops are chasing him, people are chasing him, hiding out from this, hiding out from that. Everything was going good. Had a good job, making money. I said, Frank, how's everything going? Ah, I, don't know. I said, what's the matter? Nothing. What do you mean nothing? He said, nothing. Absolutely nothing's wrong. Said, I'm miserable. <laughs> there had to be something wrong. What's the sense of this if there ain't nothing wrong? You know? That's like this thing of, you know, I mean, it's such a big favor that God's going to do for you. Hey, what good is he without you? Think of that. How could there be? He can't even exist without you. He's God. Who knows it? There's nobody but him. Look at me. I'm a hotsy totsy Ain't I something? I'm going to choose people. There ain't no people. So he might as commit suicide, and it wouldn't even be anybody to go to the funeral. Nobody's going to know this guy. <laughs> so it's not you that needs him half as much. You know why? Because you can exist without him. You really can. Many, many millions of people, they don't, they don't know from God, for God to with him. What is this? I don't need this. I'm not. Never even think of them. They get up, they go, they have a nice time, they get a good job, they make a few bucks, they cause this, they have a little sex, they eat, they go to the bathroom, they, they get up every day the same, they drop that, they put them in a hole, they don't know from God. They didn't need them, they don't want them, they don't like them, don't talk to me about it. But what about him? He can't exist at all without people. 
Because there can't be any such a thing. And so, you come to this, come out from among them. And what is being said by the bridegroom is you are surrounded by these thoughts which are battering you from this side to that side, and you've got to get out from them and get to your holy place. And I will receive you. Let's go back to the Song of Solomon. And I love this part. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 10. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And look at verse 11. For the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The time of the winter solstice. Do you know what's going on right now? Huh? Right now. The winter is coming upon us. The sun is going down. The Son of God, God's only begotten Son in this universe is coming down. And on December the 21st, it will be crucified in the constellation of the Southern Cross. Did you know that? It will happen. On December the 21st is crucifixion day because the Son will cross the constellation Crux, C-R-U-X, which is the Southern Cross. And then when the Son is crucified, on December the 22nd, December the 23rd, and December the 24th is the winter solstice. And the sun will be entombed in the bowels of the earth in the world's darkest days. But on December the 25th, the trajectory of the earth, the sun is born. And the sun begins its rise back up to meet Aries and the sacrifice of the lamb takes place at the spring equinox and all things become new and the lights come back on and the winter dissipates and all of the cold goes away and all of new life comes and all that was barren and dormant is over and it says for lo the winter is past the spring comes the time of Aries is here. The burnt offering takes place. Once the burnt offering has taken place, then there can be new life. And so the sun mounts itself on the altar of sacrifice and consumes the lamb, Aries, the lamb of God. And when it consumes Aries, the lamb of God, then it sits at the right hand and summer comes. You can't have summer unless the sun consumes Aries. It can't happen. Astronomically, it can't happen. It's impossible. So all of those things have to happen. The sun has to go through the cross. It has to sit in the bowels of the earth three days and three nights. It's got to be born on December the 21st. It's got to rise up and consume the burnt offering of Aries and then sit in the eastern sky in the northern hemisphere at the right hand and summer comes. Otherwise, summer can't come. All these things occur. And so it says, hey, the winter is over. And it says, the rain is over and gone. Now that's an important thing. Did you know that? That's very, very important. For lo, come rise up, my love. Come away, for lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. Watch. Go to page 6 in the Bible. Page 6. Genesis 8. We're closing in on this now, okay? Genesis chapter 8, page 6. I want to just show you something that may be of interest to you because we just saw that the rain is over and gone. Now, if you go to Genesis chapter 8, verse 2, okay? And the rain from heaven was restrained. Do you see that? And the waters returned from off the earth continually. And after the end of 150 days, the waters abated. That's 6. Verse 4, and the ark rested in the seventh. seventh month. The Sabbath takes place. Okay? The 17th is rupture, the breaking, the breaking away, the separation. The 17 means, if you t what that you do is you take, the way that you do numerology with the ancients is you take that number 17, 1 plus 7 equals 8. The number 8 means rupture. In other words, there is a complete separation. That's where Jesus said, I have brought a sword, a two-edged sword. But these are the numbers that are very important because as the rain ends or the storms end at the 6th, then the Sabbath comes on the 7th. The Sabbath is always the Sabbath. There's always resting. And now you've seen the ark rested on the 7th. Uh -huh. And so then, Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 11, the winter is past, the rain is gone. Okay, and now we come to the part that you have come here tonight for. 
What does he have to say? I asked you uh, when we started, what does the turtle say? What does the turtle say? Verse 12, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of the singing of birds has come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The flowers appear, there is new color, there is peace within, there is love from be above the singing birds within. All of this is symbolism proclaiming the spring of your heart, isn't it? All things are about to turn for you into love. Now this is what turtle means in mysticism. Okay? The turtle in mysticism is the higher plane, which is the top shell, the lower plane, or the carnal, which is the bottom shell, and the self within. The turtle is the higher plane, the bottom shell is the lower plane, and the mind is in the center, energized by the divine light. And the voice of the turtle is this. The planes between both he and you, that which is One second. Oh. We're done. Okay, hold on. Just, you got it? I'm going to start? Okay. Here, what we're talking about. The higher plane is the top of the turtle. The lower plane is the bottom of the turtle. The center is that which is the divine self. This is what is important, and this is what the voice of the turtle says. The higher plane and the bottom plane are equally important to the life in the center. Ah, oh, I want to have, I want to be spiritual. You can't be spiritual unless you're physical. I want to have a new life. I want to have a new physical life. You can't have a new physical life unless you're spiritual. So the voice of the turtle goes out in all the land, and we should listen to the voice of the turtle, because so many of us want to have that which is the physical realm, and we don't want to bother with that which is the spiritual realm. Others want to be spiritual. They don't want to bother with that which is the physical realm. But the voice of the turtle says, no, I've got to have the top. I've got to have the bottom if I'm going to be safe in the center. If I'm going to be centered, then I'm going to be centered. And so your physical body is equally as important as your higher mind. And that's basically what the voice of the turtle says. And the turtle is that divine word who dives deep into the deep water of truth and is found by the seeker. But to me, it's so very, very important that as we hear these things, you begin, did you ever think, if does anybody, have you ever been to a church? Have you ever been to a Bible study where any of these people would say, what the heck does that mean? What does it mean? Does anybody, as there a preacher, does anybody say, what does it mean, the voice of the turtle? What does the turtle mean? I didn't make up what the turtle means. It's what it means mystically. I didn't make up that shoot the bull means have a conversation. That's what it means. And I know it because I live it, because it's part of our culture. I didn't, I didn't make up that if you spill the beans, it means you talked out of turn. The beans are beans. You can have pasta beans or pinto beans or refried beans. Beans are beans. But no, when you spill the beans, you make a mess on the floor. No, you don't. When you spill the beans, you shut your mouth off. Oh, he shot his mouth off. Call the first aid squad. No, it doesn't mean he shot his mouth off. It means he talked when he shouldn't have talked. Well, that's off the wall. No, it doesn't mean it's off the wall. It means that it's just... All of these things that you say, none of them mean what they say, and yet you know exactly. And this is the same way. If you look up a book of mysticism, like Gaskell's book, you'll see the turtle protecting the self with the higher and that which is the lower. So we went through the whole thing of an hour, and the voice of the turtle got 10 seconds. But the most important part of the whole thing was what the turtle said. Don't negate the lower self. Don't negate the higher self because the two of them were necessary to protect that which is in the center. If you rip out the bottom of the turtle, he dies. If you rip out the top of the turtle, he dies. But if you leave those top, he will then hide within himself. And when the danger is over, he will come out 
and place his feet back on the ground, and place his head and look around and move on with his business. And the turtle has a place to hide, and most people don't have as much sense as the turtle. They don't know where to hide within themselves. Thank you very much.